um, Warren's about to present. So off he goes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks for thanks for asking me to this. It is quite a surreal experience um, talking to a silent room on this webinar, but I'll try my best. It's also um, failing new ground for me. I've given a couple of talks on robotics, but I'm a clinical psychologist. This isn't my my territory. But as you see, the reason is I'm interested in robotics because of the general way that they are they provide a testing ground for theories of behavior and cognition. And the theory that I'm going to introduce is perceptual control theory. Okay, so um, some people might think we already understand behavior. I think there's actually some big questions about it. So um, I'm going to kind of go through that define what we might be mean by behavior and how we can conceptualize behavior in relation to control, give you a bit of the background of a PCT, um, and then explain an experimental method called testing for the control variable, a bit about how PCT has been provided in robotics in the past. Then I'm gonna share a study um, that very luckily um, came about through a, a chance meeting I had with uh, Simon Watson um, at a, a pilot science talk and we, um, put heads together and decided that it would be time to do a comparative study of a PCT controller and um, another contemporary engineering controller and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that to you. And then say a little bit about <clears throat> our future plans and also tell you a bit about um, a handbook that's coming out next month on, on all of this really. Okay. So why do we need to re-understand behavior? Well, it's critical that we understand what behaviour is because, as you imagine, it applies to such wide disciplines, including my own, and various disciplines within life, social sciences, um, engineering. Um, and I think, I, th I think people thought they fully understood behaviour when behaviourism um, arose and there was a, an ambition to measure behavior very accurately from the kind of experimenters observers perspective um, and it's interesting because uh, around the middle of the last century there were challenges put towards behaviorism um, to the point that it was argued that there was a cognitive revolution in the 50s and 60s um, that might be the case but actually if you look at the um, still the dominant research um, approaches uh, for example, for learning, they're still um, built from the basic behaviorist uh, principles. And arguably that is the prevailing artificial intelligence paradigm. I'm sure there's others as well, but... Um, and so one of the, the, the key questions that PCT asks is, should we be defining behavior from the observer's perspective? Or would we get a much better understanding of what behavior is if we try to take the perspective of the behavior, the behavior, rather than the observer. There's a very elegant article that uh, came out by a colleague of mine, uh, Alex Gomez-Marin um, in Neuron um, last year called The Life of Behaviour, which, which makes this case. And it's very much attuned with uh, the approach of PCT. Um, so I'm just gonna do a bit of a thought experiment, see if this fits with the, the format. I normally do this in person. I'm gonna show a video. The video is of two people and you'll see <clears throat> each of the pe pe person's hands on the video. Each of them is holding a pen. Um, and the person on the right is me. The person on the left is a volunteer who I've given an instruction to. Okay. Um, and I want you to watch the video. Some of you might have seen this before. Um, if you have, just sort of hold fire. Um, you're, you, you've got to work out what the person on the left is doing, what I've instructed them to do. So, okay. Is that video coming out? Can everyone see that? So the person on the left with the green pen is being told to do something, okay? And in a moment, I'm hoping to hear from one of you as to what you think it is they were told to do if you haven't seen this before. Okay. Does anybody want to unmute and suggest what that person on the left was instructed to do? Is it mirror your reactions? Is it to mirror my reactions? That's a very common um, thought that it's to, to mirror what I'm doing, mirror my movements. It does look like that. 
thanks for, for guessing, but unfortunately that's not the correct answer. I didn't ask the person to mirror my actions. Could it be? Oh, sorry. Go I was ahead. just going to. Oh, sorry. Okay, thanks. I was just going to suggest, could it be to keep the knot on the dot? Yes, that is exactly what the instruction was. So if you got that right, then you were exactly right. The instruction was to keep the knot on the dot. Okay. Some other people often say it's to draw a picture of like two kangaroos boxing or to do the opposite or to react against me. Lots of explanations that really revolve around the observable behavior. Um, but um, let's see if we can rewatch this. Um, if you watch this again, hopefully you'll see, like Keith wor uh, worked out there, that the knot in the middle of the rubber band spends most of the time in the visual location of the dot. And that's because I asked the person on the left to keep the knot over the dot, okay? And we've done uh, studies of this. Uh, this is a, oh, I might have to get to the end of it. Um, but in, in this, we've run four studies on this effect now, and the vast majority of people don't come up with that answer. Um, so I'll show you that graph when it comes to the end of the, the video. That's good. No? Oh, yeah, I know what I need to do. Yeah, super. So we've called this phenomenon control blindness. I mean, it's the idea that we often don't see what someone else is controlling. We often focus on their behavior and try and explain it in that way. Um, and in our studies, we found that um, very few people, study one, I don't think anyone got the correct answer. About 13% study two, we've done other studies since. We've even done a study where we got people to, folk, to look at the, the rubber band and they still didn't work out what the person on the left was, was instructed to do. Um, we've also constructed a computer model which shown that's, that's reproduced that observable behavior, but the computer model is a control, control unit which is trying to control the position of that knot over the dot. And when we did that, we found that it was slightly off kilter, off um, uh, to, uh, the complete center. And that's because if you think about it, the person on the left who was given that instruction had a bit of a parallax error. And so we can construct um, control theory models that, that replicate behavior, but what they're doing, as in this example, is, is controlling perception. And I'll explain what we mean by, by that in a minute. Okay, so thanks for, you, for contributing there. So control in, in, this, in this term, the, the achievement and maintenance of a variable at a pre-selected state through actions that cancel out disturbances to the variable. So if we look at control and define it this way, action itself is not directly controlled. An action itself might not even be clearly defined. What's being controlled is the perception. In this case, it was keeping the knot in the visual position of the dot. Action was varying all the time to counteract the disturbance, me, to keep the knot over the dot. So it was that perceptual information extracted from the environment that was being uh, kept as close as possible to this reference standard and not over the dot. And so it was, it was William T. Powers that, that developed this idea. It does have its background in control engineering. Um, William T. Powers developed the ideas from simple negative feedback control engineering. Um, and very similar to the time that cybernetics was arising, um, Bill Powers wanted to apply control engineering to the body and the mind. And you can think of PCT as a bit like a psychological form of homeostasis, where rather than physiological processes within the body being controlled, it's sensory inputs coming into the senses that are being controlled through varying actions. It's a bit like a, an external milieu rather than internal milieu, if there's some biologists amongst you. Um, now it is basic negative feedback control, but it is also a unique configuration. Um, which I'll show you in, in a diagram. But just to, to mention that right back in 1979, Bill Powers was writing about the application of this to um, robotics. Um, so this is how um, the control unit is defined in um, PCT. For those of you, I'm sure most of you, you, you you're working within negative feedback units within control engineering. Um, there's a lot of familiar terms in here, but the, the layout and the architecture is, is particularly precise um, because we're working with what is a living system here. So there's a very clear boundary between the, the living system, the controlling system and the environment. 
And a key thing in PCT is the reference signal, which sometimes in control engineering is called the input signal, but it's not called that in PCT. The reference signal is internal, it's inside the nervous system of the controlling agent. It's not something that's set uh, from the outside. And what that entails is that these units can be organized in a hierarchy where that internal goal is set by the outputs of a system above it. And so we have internal reference points that are self-specified self uh, in, a, in a PCT system. So negative feedback, it's, it's not a linear sequence of input compare output, because it, it's all happening dynamically and simultaneously. It's a closed loop, but it's not merely a closed loop because it, it, it controls its input. The reference point is set from the inside, and then you compensate any effects of what's going on in the environment through, um, through your actions. And also there's a, there's a leaky integrator, there's a smoothing of the output that, that, that occurs as well. Um, there's various other elements of PCT besides a hierarchy, but a key one is reorganization, which we can come back to in more detail later. But that is the learning algorithm. That is what a PCT system uses instead of reinforcement learning. Because in re reinforcement presumes that there's a behavior to be reinforced. PCT behavior is in the eyes of the observer. What's being learned are these internal specifications for perceptual input. Um, and Bill Powers has argued that at its slowest, this system works about the same as a simple kind of input-output design. Um, but because it's, it's um, working with these stored reference points, it can be much more fast and efficient and compensate for sensory delays as well. Okay, we'll, we'll find that out shortly. So let's take um, one example of uh, catching a ball. Uh, to see how a PCT model would explain that. First, let's look at a traditional explanation of catching. This is one from quite famous neuroscientist, Jeffrey Hawkins. Um, we, and they invoke the idea that to catch a ball, you have the memory, the sight of the ball that gets recalled. But that memory is a, actually consists of a kind of a muscle commands and that that's adjusted then to the path of the ball. That's one potential, but it raises the questions of how are one muscle, com muscle commands in one context appropriate to another? Is it worth even having this memory of muscle commands? There may be big variations in conditions across situations. How does the system decide on what time frame to make predictions for this temporal path, etc.? So I would argue that in, the, in a model that's often used in cognitive science and then used in a lot of um, model-based systems these days, there is an enormous amount of complexity involved in trying to make these, make these predictions. Um, but in a PCT system, it doesn't predict. It just um, selects the input variables that if it controls them while it's acting, then it will achieve its goal. It'll be in the right place in the right time. Um, so this is the system that Rick Markin produced to uh, model a fielder in a, in a um, baseball game. Very simple system, just two uh, control units, one for one vertical, one lateral. The lateral one is just a position controller that is trying to keep the perception of the ball in the center of the retina of the um, system. And then there's a second control unit, which is actually um, extracted the vertical optical velocity of the ball. So this is not a direct parallel of the actual movement of the ball. This is merely the velocity of the visual image of the ball on the retina as it's rising upwards as the fielder moves dynamically to be in the right position to catch it. And when you uh, build this model, you find you can throw the ball to kind of various random positions. This is the ball being launched at a, a, a random uh, trajectory and it finds its way to the right two-dimensional position to, to catch the ball. It's working because it's got its own retina, if you like. It's trying to kind of keep this, uh, these two perceptual variables uh, in, in the uh, control states. The third uh, graph here shows you that the behavior every time is different. The speed that it's running, 
is different, the direction that it's running is different. It's not learning that behavior. That behavior is just um, being dynamically adjusted on the fly to keep those perceptual um, variables as, they, as it wants them to be. There is no modeling of the physics of this system, of the external environment, of the body of the, of the fielder. There's none of that modeling within the control unit itself. Obviously there's modeling of the environment as the environment, but the, the nervous system of this uh, simulated agent is not doing any form of prediction or emulation of the environment itself. Okay, um, I'm not sure whether it's, it, shall I carry on for a bit or has anybody got any questions? Okay, I'll carry on for a bit. So this is where we come to hierarchies. Um, so I think as I alluded to before, the signals going down in hierarchies in PCT are, they specify the perceptual results of actions. They don't give motor commands. They give reference values for ascending signals, for how the agent wants its perceptions to be, wants its inputs to be. They're not predicted states, they're desired states. All levels work simultaneously at bidirection, in a bidirectional pathway. And it's only the lowest level of a hierarchy that actually interfaces with the body and the environment outside. Everything else is internal to the, to the nervous system. Bill Powers spent inordinate amount of times introspecting on what the human um, levels might be um, for uh, perceptual control. And I'm not going to go into these in detail, but this is a quite a neat diagram to illustrate the fact that. What we have here is very simple perceptual variables at the, at the bottom of the hierarchy going in successive layers upwards to become increasingly more abstract. Um, and the idea is that if you're, for example, trying to control a program, trying to do an if-then kind of program, you don't do that by employing actions directly. You employ that by setting sequences, which in turn rely on certain categories, which in, in turn rely on certain relationships, which in turn rely on how events are uh, categorized, et cetera. So anything that is controlled at a higher level does so through these intermediate levels. Um, now for doing the inverted pendulum that we've covered, we had to simplify this quite a bit, but this is kind of like the, the ideal, if you like, if you're gonna try and explain PCT for the, the sort of the complete adult human. And there's some work on the kind of developmental stages involved in these, these layers. Um, the hierarchy isn't a linear thing. It probably looks, this is from somewhere else, but it probably looks a lot more like this, more like a small world branching network. Okay, so on to PCT robotics. As I said, um, Bill Powers did some precursor work for robotics. Um, so beyond those byte articles, he also modeled a, um, a kind of a, a tracking of a, um, of a pointing system in a 1999 paper. Then he started work on an inverted pendulum, which then a, a um, mathematician and engineer at UEA, Richard Kenaway, reproduced. And that's, that was the model that we tested. But there's a, there's a scattering of other robotic systems informed by PCT that you can see from, from these uh, citations, including quite a bit of work that uh, Roger K. Moore has done in Sheffield. Um, who I've uh, talked to about this. Um, and then a lot of work um, by uh, Rupert Young, who's worked for the last two or three years building robots and using PCT software. So this is his software, for example, in a Baxter robot that he, he was using to reproduce Tai Chi movements at Bristol Labs. And what he did is he reproduced, you can see this on YouTube, but he reproduced the Tai Chi movements by adding various weights of disturbances. Um, the, the, the PCT model doesn't have any modeling of these, but it, 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 can, it, it uh, accounts for them and reproduces the Tai, tai Chi movement. Um, but Rupert hadn't done any uh, comparative work with his PCT models. Just to kind of remind you, it's probably obvious, but it's a perception-based system, it's widely distributed. When Rupert runs these Robots, they, they exhibit graceful degradation, which is what you would hope from a um, robust robotic system. Um, and it doesn't predict, as I say, but it, it decomposes everything into a, 
into a perceptual goal, goal into a sort of desired input. So um, the study that I uh, worked, well, I, I kind of started the design of with uh, Simon Watson and then was run by a sequence of uh, um, postgraduate students um, was to, for the first time, compare a PCT robot against another robot. Um, we actually kept the hardware exactly the same. We started off with a simulation and then moved to very simple, a Lego Mindstorms robot. Um, and the aim was to compare PCT with an LQR uh, algorithm in control engineering. Now I'm not uh, an expert on this, but I do know that it involves various predictive modeling of the um, robot and its, and its environment and kind of physics and kinematics of the process. So it's quite computationally intensive in a way that the PCT controller uh, wasn't. So we, were, we already have this difference in parsimony, whereby the PCT, PCT system is more parsimonious. It's also got kind of less free variables. It's only got one, one reference point that you set externally. Um, and then we, we ran the same robot under um, the same conditions, but we replaced the software controller. Um, both robots were optimized manually, and that is a, that is a limitation. But they were opt optimized manually as well as as well as Tom, who did this, could do within three days. And he, so he was he was tweaking the parameters to to get both of them to perform to their to their best. This is the PCT uh, controller. Um, I'm not going to go into huge details about it, but those of you who are engineers will be very familiar with this this notation. But you'll see particularly from it this this hierarchical nature. In the end, we only needed one uh, leaky integrator in the system. Um, these, these are largely gain values, these Ks. Um, the same, it, when we did the simulation, obviously the system's dynamics, the environment was the same for both uh, controllers as were the disturbances. Um, and we were testing various sort of indices of how good the control was in these, in these two systems. Uh, I think I've said that. Um, so yeah, th this is the full, full authorship for the paper, which is published um, in the Journal of Intelligent and Robotic Systems. We've also got, got a, uh, a kind of a press release on, on this as well. Um, that's what the uh, Lego robot inverter pendulum looked like. Um, that's just explaining where the, the, the different displacement values, what they represent how the movement of it was recorded through 12 motion capture cameras. And this is a video, I'm going to be quiet now because I couldn't work out how to get the uh, audio off this anyway. This is my voice demonstrating and uh, explaining the differences between um, the, the same robot running with the two different controllers. The robot balanced better than with the current software from engineers. even kept better balance when we prodded it unexpectedly. Okay, so that gives you a bit of a, an idea of the, the visuals, the um, dynamics of, of its performance. Here's the, the plot of um, angular displacement where you can compare, so the PCT is in red, so that's its uh, displacement from vertical over time, and you can see the contrast with the um, LQR and a, a, a basic proportionate controller. It had a smaller steady state error. It could rebalance after quite large disturbances better than the other system. And it could also move to a new starting point that we, we couldn't manage to get the, the other controllers to do. So generally we found these are advantages of uh, the PCT system. Um, so, so a number of these areas. So it, it really, I think this is really exciting. Maybe I'm naive, but it feels like there's a, a candidate theory here for improving the balance of 
um, machines that it's that it might explain balance in, in other living things we do need to automate the optimization so that we can um, know that that there wasn't a differential there uh, so we do want to, to run this with uh, reorganization where it's uh, kind of self-optimizing um, but um, so so all of this is kind of setting I think and I hope setting the um, steps towards a form of uh, robotics that is maybe more inspired by the functional neural architecture of, of um, animals biological systems um, it also suggests to us that we maybe should be using the methodologies inspired by PCT um, and this is called the test for the controlled variable and it's a very different experimental design to what we're used to certainly in psychology and a lot of neuroscience and the idea is that you um, disturb a, uh, a human an animal or a, or a robot and work out through your disturbances what variable it must be controlling in order to um, maintain um, stability or, or to um, defy your disturbances um, and the PCT kind of angle on that is that you, you, you need to be defining that in terms of what the, the agent can perceive. Um, and that in our terms is the way that you define um, the, the psychology really of um, both a living and a non-living agent. Um, this is a theory that I use in psychology to kind of understand aspects like uh, treating phobias, like personality and, and other aspects. Um, there's also a form of task analysis uh, informed by it um, and you know we going forward it, we, we do want to be able to to work with people with the kit to to test these ideas out we did submit two large studies to H2020 which we weren't successful with and so we would like to be able to test this with to collaborate with people that, that do have the, the time and, and the hardware if they're willing. I think the really exciting thing about PCT is that it's not just a theory of psych, in psychology, it's not just a theory in engineering. These are just a spattering of the areas that PCT has been applied to since its sort of inception in, in the 60s and 70s. And, it, and it's enormous. Uh, and each of those, these, um, researchers and practitioners in these areas are doing something different to what their colleagues are because of the principles that this this theory uh, provides and because of my interest in this interdisciplinary nature of PCT um, that really encouraged me quite a while ago over a decade now to really engage with all of the researchers very diverse backgrounds that we're using this theory such that that now I've been in a position to edit um, this handbook. There's about 18 chapters in here, and each of them is written by leading theorists and researchers um, on different facets of how they've, they've used uh, perceptual control theory. Um, we've got a Twitter site, um, which is just at IAPCT, where I do updates on this and updates on new, new PCT um, approaches. Um, but it's quite exciting. This book will be available um, uh, by the middle of June. Um, okay, so I think I'm happy to stop there as it's been just over 30 minutes. I've got other slides on reorganisation, um, but they're probably best digested once um, we've kind of taken stock of what I've stated so far. So I'll shut up now. Thank you for listening. Okay, do, does anyone have any questions? Would you like to sort of put your video back on so we can see you so it's not quite anonymous names? There's a question from Farshad. Let me turn them on. I can't see where they are. <laughs> turn yourself on, Farshad. I can't, I can't find you on the list. Uh, yes. There yeah. you Just my question was, you compared PCT with like P-controller or uh, AQR how you tuned those other controllers like Picon? Do we know is it perfectly tuned or, I mean, how we reach All, first all I can say is that um, the research student that worked on them tuned them as 
as best as he could and that their performance was pretty identical to the published performance of those controllers in those studies. The reasons why we chose the LQR was because it was contemporary. There were a number of, L number of LQR inverted pendulum controllers published and we used one of those and the performance is pretty the same. So it's unlikely he could have controlled it massively better given that it's similar to what's published. Thank you. I know there's better inverted pendulum papers out there, but that might be something to do with the hardware or, or the, the kind of experimental setup. Warren, do you want me to chip in on that as well? Oh yeah, Simon, yeah, cool. So oh, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, so the, I mean, the study wasn't to quantifiably show that the, the, the difference between the two controllers performance, we were initially setting off to show is PCT comparable to modern controllers, um, not to optimize the, the classic controllers so that we can say, right, the performance is 50% better if you use PCT or it's 25% worse if, if you use the, the LQR, whatever it was. So it was tuned manually. I think as Warren said in the presentation, it, there, there are optimization algorithms that could be applied to it to get the performance better. But the, we, we don't think that that's gonna change from the general conclusion that PCT appears to be comparable to the classical control methods. We have a question from Mohammed now. Yes, hello, thank you for such an interesting talk. And I have a question about the, uh, the case of the, uh, uh, the baseball player. How is this different from visual serving and robots where the robot tries to keep a certain object, for example, in, its, uh, in the center of its field of view? Uh, isn't it basically the same it, for, for some robots, for some systems, it will be functionally identical. Now, whether the robot was, um, whether the operator and the programmer of the robot used exactly the same architecture to achieve it is one matter, but it's, possi it's, it's possible that for some robots, this will be functionally identical. Um, you know, it's, in a way, it's functionally identical to a thermostat, you know, because a thermostat mm -hmm. works, we would argue, by controlling its input. You know, it doesn't, a thermostat hasn't got an intelligent system that knows, you know, what exact, what exact amount of heat, heat output it needs to send into a room. So it yeah. is just based on that same principle. The advantage of having the reference point and knowing the reference point is internal to the system is that then you can build hierarchies and it can start to set those reference points, change them dynamically for itself. Okay, the next question is from uh, William Heath. I, I have a comment and a question, but first of all, many thanks for that talk. I really enjoyed it. No um, the, the comment is, is about the LQR and ab absolutely, it's not about proving which is the better control strategy and so forth. I, I suspect any amount of tuning wouldn't improve the LQR you've used. The, the standard way of um, introducing better disturbance rejection would be to include extra states in the LQR. So I wonder if changing the LQR structure would get a better comparison. My, my question is, is about the baseball catcher. Um, and I'm aware of the, the gaze heuristic, which Gigarenza talked about, which is equally about catching a ball and um, effect, effectively it's similar to what you talked about. And I was wondering if, if you know if they've got the same route or if it's different research groups that come to the same conclusion independently. Well, all I know is that um, Bill Powers was a kind of independent scientist who wasn't in academia. And he kind of claims to have got his insight from working on electronic systems in the, the early 50s. So he he describes it as a realization that these electronic systems were already controlling their inputs. They weren't controlling their outputs. And from that point onwards, that's, that's the kind of semantics he kept to. And it's that, that conceptualization of a control system that then led him to build the architecture in this way. So, um, He's, so his kind of heritage is really just pure engineering, um, sort of kind yeah. of Harold Black kind of 
negative feedback controllers rather than anything from from biology at that stage yeah. of his writings it, it sounds like it's independent so i'll just put a link to the gay heuristic on the chat so oh, brilliant. See it. any further questions at the minute no do you want to carry on with the other things warren or are you happy to yeah i'd be quite happy to if people um Want to see them, but if people need to have a break or kind of need to need to go now, that's that's fine, obviously as well. Um, okay, so I'll say a little bit about reorganisation. Um, I'm not going to talk about modelling of this. I just wanted to share it because um, obviously we talked about optimization, so it does beg the question of how do these systems self-optimise? Um, so. Reorganization is, is the kind of learning algorithm in PCT. It's, you, could, you could describe it as the trial and error optimization of the control parameters within the perceptual hierarchy. Um, there'll be some writings that have likened it to a kind of variation and selection process uh, that you get in natural selection in biology. Um, and that's quite a good analogy. I've, I've kind of pointed to this analogy that just as in um, in natural selection, you're, it's the um, genotype that gets passed on, even though it's the phenotype that interacts with the environment and determines fitness. You can see that analogy operating within control systems. The idea is that it's the control system internal parameters that get passed on, but it's the behavior with the environment that determines the fitness or the, the adaptiveness or the control abilities of that control system. So what we see therefore is behavior is not learnt. What's learnt is the control systems that in their dynamic interactions to control their input, behavior is, is, uh, emerges and is observed. Um, it's also been kind of modeled as a kind of random walk algorithm um, as a kind of tumbling motion of, uh, analogous to the tumbling motion of an E. coli bacterium. So what that kind of, works like is as the bacterium uh, moves away from the um, location of food the chemical gradient it goes down the chemical gradient and it tumbles in a random direction if then it goes up the chemical gradient towards the source of food it stops tumbling so it's this kind of error driven uh, reorganization process and there's a couple of papers that I've cited there that have um, mathematically modeled it um, one of these is Power's last book uh, in 2008, where he's got quite a sophisticated uh, modelling of reorganisation um, of uh, arm of arm control of moving of, of a limb. Um, now, Power says a little bit more about how this might actually work in in the kind of in the human system. He proposes that we're we're born with what he calls intrinsic control systems, and these are ones that, that work at a physiological level. Um, they are controlling for inputs like um, pain input, body temperature, ambient noise, for example. Those are unlearned. And those, those oh, there, and there may be an additional variable which he called control quality, which is like the sums, the sort of root mean squared error across all the control units in the nervous system. So that need for control could be an, another contributor to these intrinsic systems. Um, and the idea is that the greater the error in those intrinsic systems, the more it drives um, rates of change in the key parameters of the perceptual control systems. And those are the functions, the gains, and the weights of connections uh, within the hierarchy. Now, what there isn't in PCT is any specification of what order those um, parameters will be reorganized. Um, and when it's been modeled, it's normally been the output gain that's been reorganized. Um, but the idea is that when a system is in error, um, it sort of, it proportionately tumbles the rates of change of uh, these parameters within the perceptual control system. And then that change stops to the extent that control is reestablished and the intrinsic uh, needs of the organism, the intrinsic systems of the organism are put back in equilibrium. So think about it kind of diagrammatically, what Powers is arguing is that there's another control system or set of control systems, biological ones, 
which have a more of a genetic source for their reference values. And these, this reorganization system is constantly um, monitoring the physiological effects of being in or out of balance with the environment um, and meeting those physiological needs. And to the extent that those aren't met, it, it drives um, what, what's described as organization altering effects. It drives trial and error changes in the parameters of these systems. So when we ran that, um, uh, that pendulum, none of these parameters were changing. We'd optimized it and then we'd fixed the parameters. So parameters change over a slower time scale than obviously the signals passing through this. But this is just an idea here of how this works. It begs the question of how do you know where to reorganize? And this is actually what we cover in, in psychological therapy with the principle that you don't need to change your religion to learn how to tie your shoelaces. You need to focus your reorganization process on the perceptual system that requires rewiring. And the idea is that's what awareness is. And so a psychologist is very interested in where this reorganization function is, is making trial and error changes with the idea that you need to shift it to where the, the point is in the control hierarchy that it's going to fix the error as it were and, and reestablish control. Um, another aspect, kind of another kind of element of PCT that kind of falls out of the basic structure is the notion of what memory is. So the idea is that actually a lot of reference signals are um, stored memories of um, previous uh, perceptions that have gone through the system. And this allows us to um, not only appreciate what learning might be, but what memory might be. And they're very different in PCT. Learning is not the same as memory. Memory is a, is a kind of stored um, perceptual trace. And one thing that this allows in, in, in Bill's models is that there's a switching process whereby the system can substitute the memory for a perceptual input for the input itself. So you, so you allow these, these kind of reafferent, these recurrent connections within the system, which may be involved in what we think of as um, when we do see people doing what we think is predicting, that they're actually doing mental simulations of, of previous inputs. And we might be doing the same thing when we're doing mental imagery, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in reality, this might be more of a graded system than a, than a switch. We're not, not quite sure yet. Um, and so, you know, the, there's are, there are big gaps in, in PCT. Part of this is working out um, how these functions are developed in the first place. You know, how does a, uh, an, an organism or a robot uh, learn to extract, let's say, velocity, vertical velocity from, from, the, um, from its input? Um, there are questions around how this develops, uh, particularly in human development. And there's also the question of when you've got multiple agents, how do they all work together? Uh, and particularly, obviously, in, in, with humans, how, does that, how do we use language and other symbol systems to engage with what, what a colleague calls collective control, which is where we work together to control inputs that we all share or we can all recognise?